We're going to look at Mary Magdalene, who came up higher in my estimation as I studied about her the last couple of weeks. Uh, she may be one of the most significant women in Scripture because she is one of the few that are mentioned in every gospel. Actually, she has more mentions than the mother of Christ when you consider the uh, passage as a mention. Um, the problem is that we look at Mary Magdalene maybe through uh, glasses that are colored by our culture. Let me just say that Magdalene is the name of Magdala is a town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And it was in the area where Jesus did the first year and a half, basically, of ministry. And he was headquartered right on top of it. My Gadala is about five miles across that corner. I'm sure that Jesus crossed paths with her many times. That's a little town, uh, but it was famous for weaving large cloth of flax and of wool and dyeing the cloth. Uh, well, let's think first of all about some things about Mary Magdalene. I'd like you to, to divorce from your concept of her. <laughs> uh, and these are things that are prominent in our culture. They had their beginning back not long after the time of Christ when a group of people with the name Gnostics uh, began writing a different gospel. Uh, that has nothing to do with the gospel we find in scripture and it was very popular the basic premise of it for salvation was that you're not saved by faith through grace you're saved through attaining another level of knowledge which is very appealing even today we all want to know secrets so many shows on television are about revealing the secrets of this that and the other uh, but there are things in the Gnostic writings about Mary Magdalene that said she was an immoral woman and that became attached to her reputation. Uh, I will just tell you, in our age, there are several things that have fostered it and pushed it forward. Uh, back in my day, Jesus Christ Superstar, which not only suggested uh, something immoral between Mary Magdalene and Christ. It pretty well displayed it. Uh, in 2004, The Passion of Christ, that movie, which was very popular and has much that is not true in it. 2006, The Da Vinci Code. Sixty million of those books were printed that year, and it is filled with heresies and fables from Gnostic writings, including about Mary Magdalene. Uh, and then another one I'll mention in a moment. The first thought I'd like you to avoid was that she was married to or had a secret affair with Christ, which is in this teaching, an old lie about her. Uh, how do you know that's not true? Did Jesus ever sin? Are you sure? <laughs> Do you have any scripture to prove that? <laughs> I have two on your sheet. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin. And Christ our high priest was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And this is like the Gnostic writings. They disagree with what's in Scripture. So we know that is not true. And another reason I know it's true, because Christ had enemies that hated him, and they accused him of everything they could think of, glutton, wine-bibber, uh, blasphemer, and liar. But they never accused him of adultery. If that had been on the table, don't you think they would have? I'm surprised they did not. Another lie is that she is the woman that was caught in adultery, brought to Christ to be stoned in John 8. Uh, but another reason I feel like this is not her, because I don't think she was this big sinner, but uh, because adulterous women in Scripture are never named. We've studied uh, 
the Samaritan woman at the well, and we call her by that descriptor because we don't have her name. Now, she was an adulterous woman. She had had five husbands and was living with somebody who was not her husband, but she is not named. Another lie is that she was a prostitute because Magdala was not only noted for its weaving, it was noted for prostitutes. Do you think Gallatin has any prostitutes? Does that mean we're prostitutes because we're from Gallatin? <laughs> no, that's not, a, that's not a thing. And in scripture, people with demons are never characterized as having sexual immorality. Never. And then the fourth lie, that she was violent when she was inhabited by demons. This is from a current dramatic reenactment of scripture that I know many believers are enamored with. But I feel like it, was, uh, it has things that are not correct. I listened to six minutes of it, and when I saw them portraying Mary Magdalene as having stabbed someone because of her demons, I just had to cut it off. Uh, that's not true. No, nobody with demons in the scripture is ever, uh, that Christ dealt with, is ever talked about as hurting others, even the Gadarene demoniac, the guy that had thousands of demons and didn't wear any clothes and cut himself with stones. Uh, I had always thought that he attacked other people and injured them. I read all the three Gospels that tell that story several times, and you know that's not in there at all. And I didn't realize I had ascribed that to him, because I bet somebody said it, one of my teachers or somebody in the pulpit. So we want to embrace truth about Mary Magdalene. I hated to even bring up the lies, but they are in our culture today and to even say her name is to bring these thoughts to someone's name well what is the truth about mary magdalene this is what we find from scripture the first thing she served in christ's ministry in galilee and we look at luke chapter 8 if you'd like to open your bibles there this tells us that jesus went throughout every city and village in galilee And he was preaching the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Now, rabbis taught that women were not capable of learning. In fact, the Jews in Jerusalem had made it illegal for even a man to teach his wife in public. But Jesus accepted women as listeners and as followers. Ladies, this was amazing for the culture. Uh, Verse 1 tells us that as Jesus was preaching, the twelve were with him, and certain women, more than one, which had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went, what? Seven devils. The scriptures say that twice. Uh, But the scriptures say nothing about what it was like for Mary Magdalene before Christ did that. And then others in the group, Joanna, whose husband was Herod's steward. This tells me that the gospel is reaching up to high levels of government with Christ preaching. And Susanna, who is never named again in scripture, unknown to us, but known in heaven. (laughs) Because she ministered to Christ. And then it says in verse 3, many other women who ministered to him with their substance or with their contributions of food or money to buy food. These were probably all women with means. Because what poor woman could leave her family and, and do this? But it does say they were all healed of evil spirits. Uh, I know that they loved Christ. I cannot imagine the difference he made in their life. No wonder they were willing to follow him around and help prepare food 
He was always with a group of 13 men. Have you ever fed 13 men? That is not a small job. (laughs) And yet they were willing to do it. Now, in list of the women who ministered to Christ, Mary Magdalene is always first, with one exception, which we'll look at in a moment. So I don't know if she kind of had a leader personality, if she was a good administrator and they just kind of let her organize. Um, We do not know her age. In all the lies, she is young and beautiful and seductive. But she may have been older than any of us. (laughs) We're not told. She apparently had no family ties to tie her at home, husband, children, parents, so she might have been an older person. Uh, What I love about this is that when Mary Magdalene was delivered of her demons, she became a follower of Christ. I mean, she left home to be a follower of Christ. She meant business. She was glad to be a servant of Christ. That passage that I've given you from Romans says, being made free from sins, you became the servants of righteousness. So are you a servant of righteousness? Am I one? Is that what I spend my time with? But as to what her life was like with those demons, the scripture pulls the curtain of silence around it. And I don't want anybody telling me what it was like for her. I just know it was bad. Because the scripture talks about people with demons as being vexed, being grievously vexed, being troubled, being suicidal, uh, being restless. What a life she had. Well, I appreciate that she has come to Christ with 100% of her being, and she's going to now be a servant of Christ. But Mary Magdalene followed Jesus all the way to Jerusalem at the end and all the way to the cross. I put some references on your sheet just so we wouldn't have to flip back and forth. She was present at the cross. Look at that first one, John 19, verse 25. Where is Mary standing? By the cross. What does by mean? (laughs) Close. Close. She was standing by the cross. This is the place where she's not mentioned first in a group. But look who's in this group. Who else was there? Jesus' mother. And his mother's sister, who would be Jesus' aunt. So these are relatives. I understand why they're mentioned first. Mary, the wife of Cleophas. And Mary Magdalene. So she was right by the cross. She observed in this passage the crucifixion has just occurred. And in the verse after this passage, the soldiers are gambling for the robe of Christ. Because it was, they didn't tear it in parts to share. Because it was a seamless garment. It was unusual. And you know, I thought this week's studying, I wonder where he got that. I always thought his mother made it for him. A man's seamless robe would be from a large piece of fabric, more a commercial application than a home uh, application. I wonder if Mary Magdalene got that for him. An expensive piece of cloth, a special robe, and she stands there. Not only is her Lord and Savior being brutally killed, the soldiers are gambling, perhaps for the gift that she gave. Can I just say this because I want you to think, what is she feeling? Uh, she was close enough to hear Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. She was close enough when Jesus committed his mother to the care of John. And yet, I wonder, as Jesus looked around, did just that tearful face encourage his heart? Somebody was there for him. And it was uh, four ladies. And the disciple John were the only ones. 
they might have been the only encouragement he had throughout the whole ordeal. But Matthew and Mark describe the end of the cross just before he died. Look at what Matthew says in 2755. Where are the women now? Are they by the cross? They're afar off. I don't know if the crowd of taunters and jeers has pushed them back. I don't know if they felt like they could not stand that close and see it anymore. I don't know if the soldiers pushed them back. Mark also says, Mark 15, 40 and 41, there were women looking on, and where are they? Afar off. And in this list, Mary Magdalene is first. And Mary, the mother of James the Less, who was the disciple. And Salome, whom I have finally decided was married to Zebedee and the mother of James and John, which would make J James and John Jesus' cousins. And now it makes sense that Jesus committed his mother to his cousin. I don't know about that for sure. I bet that's not in a movie, though. <laughs> Because it's not scintillating. Well, it says they are afar off and they are watching. Uh, and they heard the last things Jesus said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know if you've ever said that. You may have felt forsaken. I bet Mary thought, God, why have you forsaken him? What is, what is happening? Heard him say it is finished. Well, after Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two members of the Sanhedrin who apparently believed in Jesus and did not vote that he be put to death, uh, take his body, and they have Nicodemus bought what. The King James says was a hundred pounds weight. The Greek equivalent would be 72 pounds weight of spices. That's a lot of spices, isn't it? Uh, they were expensive then, just like they are now. And they were going to put the spices on his body and wrap it with strips of cloth. And look at the passage from Matthew, excuse me, Mark 15:47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of uh, the disciple. It says they beheld where Jesus was laid. Now, Joseph, Nicodemus, and these two women at least knew where his grave was. Did the disciples know? No, because they're not there. Now, that Greek word said they beheld where he was laid. It's an interesting word. It means they observed intently. They inspected closely. And then Luke tells us in a different way in 2355, he says, The women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld. They are looking at the tomb. And what did they observe? How his body was laid. Uh, and I think Mary Magdalene didn't like the way things were done. Because the next thing they do is they're getting together some spices and they're making a plan. Now, I don't know if your husband's ever cleaned your kitchen. Sometimes we just don't like how they do things here. And she loves Christ. She wants this done right. And so they get spices ready. They make their plan. Uh, I love her because I'm just like her. <laughs> well, the next thing is on the back of your sheet. She was the first person to see the risen Christ. Ooh, what an honor. Let's look at John chapter 20. And if you'd like to turn to that in your Bibles, we'll look at several verses. We are told in John 20 in the first verse that it was the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Mary Magdalene came early. Anybody there? How early? 
when it was still dark, okay? Now they planned to meet at dawn and the other ladies seemed to come at the sun rising. That's what the other gospels say. She came when it was dark. How did she know where to go? She was there when he was buried. And she sees the stone taken away. The Greek there indicates the stone was not just rolled away, but was removed and flat on the ground. Now, I know all those pictures show an angel sitting on the big round stone standing up, but that's because the artist didn't know Greek. <laughs> uh, as soon as she sees this, what does she do in verse 2? She, can't, she, she ran? Well, maybe she wasn't so old after all. I don't know. <laughs> she knew where Peter was, and she ran to him and to the other disciple, who is John, the way he always refers to himself. And what does she say to them in verse 2? All right, what did she see? The stone removed. What conclusion did she draw? That they stole his body. Uh, I'm like that too. <laughs> Sometimes I jump to a conclusion, even though I'm mistaken. And verse um, 3 says, Peter went forth and John, and the Greek indicates they were walking, but by the time you get to verse 4, what are they doing? Running. Running. <laughs> And John outran Peter and came first to the tomb. And he stooped down and looked in. He did not go in. The opening of a hewed out tomb was normally not adult height. It was small enough to crawl in, get a body in. Uh, that made it easier to cover up. Uh, and John sees the linen strips lying the word indi indicates an arrangement. They might have been in the same arrangement as they were wrapped around the body, but now nothing's in them. They're just lying there. That's unusual in the Greek. Uh, and he stooped down, looked in, saw him, but he didn't go in. Then Peter, it says, he went into the sepulcher. I think he would have had to crawl in or slither in or at least been down a lot. And he sees the linen clothes lying and the napkin that had been around Christ's head. Uh, then John, who got there first, he goes in and verse, uh, I believe this is eight. When he saw that, it's interesting to me, it said, he saw and believed. I'm not sure what he believed because the next verse John wrote, the Greek is actually because they previously didn't understand scripture that he would rise from the dead. And this is true. Their plan was he's made king and the kingdom is now. Death, even though Jesus told them several times with details. It was like shing. Uh, and then where do Peter and John go? Verse 10. Went back home. And I think, who is at John's home? Mary. I would like to hear that conversation. Well, verse 11, Mary is there and she is doing what? crying. That's the strong Greek word for crying. That's the intense crying, sobbing, wailing. If somebody's doing that, you hear it before you get to them. Bless her heart. She's weeping and she stoops down. That tells us it was a low opening and looks in. But oh, verse 12, what does she see? <laughs> Two angels. Matthew tells us they had garments as white as snow and that their faces were bright like lightning. Uh, that'd be exciting, wouldn't it? She looks in and they talk to her. Look at verse 13. They say, woman, why are you crying? <laughs> Here she's getting another opportunity to figure this out. <laughs> 
But what does she say? She is still holding on to her original conclusion, isn't she? One pastor I read entitled his sermon about this, Mary, Mary, Quite Contrary, <laughs> because she keeps having evidences, and yet she keeps holding on. Now, I'm trying to remember nursing. It seems like a false, fixed belief was the definition for a person with a mental illness when they were sure of something that was not real. Uh, and we all have the ability to do that to some extent. I often marvel that the clear teaching that I see Jesus do for his disciples, and the women would have heard it, traveling with him, that nobody got it. Uh, I think one reason she's wailing is because she's standing there holding all those spices she brought, and she wants to get to what she came for. Uh, one commentator told about uh, a time in World War II when American soldiers were prisoners of war in Germany and the war was over and somehow another a secret message got through to the prisoners but the German captors didn't know it yet they knew it for three days and you know what? They had the same miserable conditions as they had always had there, but their attitude was different because they knew they won. And Mary can't get it that Jesus has won. It's not what it looks like. Well, verse 14 tells us when she had said to the angels, uh, they, it's, do you ever talk about they? That's kind of fruitless, isn't it? Oh, just listen to what they're saying. Don't be upset. <laughs> uh, after she said that, she turned around and she saw Jesus, and she didn't know that it was Jesus. Hadn't she spent a lot of time with him? Why didn't she know it was Jesus? She's stuck on her own thing. Is she looking for anybody alive? What's she looking for? A body. Uh, she didn't know about the victory. Well, she turned herself. She saw Jesus. She didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus talks to her. He asked the same questions the angels did. Woman, why are you crying? And she supposing him to be somebody that's alive, maybe the gardener. <laughs> what does she say to him? If you're part of this conspiracy of what they did, you just tell me where the body is and what. I'll take him away. Boy, she must have been a strong woman. It took two men to bury him. Uh, bless her heart. Verse 16. Jesus said unto her, Mary. Do you recognize people in your family when they call your name? Actually, probably you recognize their voice before they speak. And it always amazes me that a phone voice can come over and I know that voice. I know who it is before they tell me who it is. Not from the name that comes up on my phone, but from hearing the voice. He said, Mary. Well, I'll have to say for Mary, seeing is not believing. Hearing <laughs> is believing. She realizes it's him. She calls him Rabboni, which would be an Aramaic term for teacher. And it's probably the language they spoke in. And that's probably what she called him as she ministered uh, to them. But I bet she had heard him say, Mary, any more of that lamb stew? <laughs> she knew that voice. Uh, I love that. John 10 tells us that Jesus calls his own sheep by name, and they know his voice. That's precious. Verse 17 
uh, Jesus said to her, the King James says, touch me not. Do some of your translations have another? Do not cling. What? Stop clinging. Anybody? Hold. Uh, I think when he called her name, what do you think she did? <laughs> she may have grabbed him in a hug. I think I would have grabbed him by the arms to see if there were arms in there. <laughs> you know, the disciples were afraid to touch him because they thought he was a ghost. In fact, Jesus said to Thomas, Come on, Thomas, touch me. Put your finger in the scar. Did Thomas ever touch him? The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just, Mary's just above the disciples <laughs> in several things. Uh, and he gives her a reason. I'm not yet ascended to my father. Uh, Mary had been with Jesus every day for maybe months. But things are not going to be like that anymore. After his death, Jesus never stayed for long periods of time with his disciples. He came and went. Mostly went. <laughs> uh, but he gives her a message to give to the eleven. Go tell them, I'm ascending unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. That's a very special message. They didn't know anything about that, did they? He never told them that part until now. Uh, the, the other Gospels tell us some of the women went back and said to the disciples, the body's not there, he's risen, after the, they had talked to angels, and he will go before you into Galilee. But Mary was the one with the special message about what was going to happen next. So look at verse 18. What does Mary do? She went to the disciples. I love this verse. It says, Mary came and told the disciples. The Greek is, Mary came talking. I think she was quite animated. <laughs> and I think they may have heard her before they saw her. She came talking how she had seen the Lord and that he had said these things. Now I would like to know why you think Mary got to be the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection, uh, got to be the first one to hear his voice, got to be the first one to touch him, got to be the first one to know that he was going back to heaven. This woman was totally sold out to him. She even went to the cross she could not even be satisfied with the way other people did a burial. She wanted to do it right. She wanted to, it to be right for him. Uh, Mary never wrote a gospel, never preached a sermon, except this one, <laughs> to my own heart. One writer said maybe God who sees our heart knew that she loved him the most or saw that she had the most grief. And poor little Mary was standing there by him, and he was the nearest being in the universe to her, and she thought he was completely gone. I think God is often near to us when we think he's not, when we don't understand. You remember that story I told you last week about the woman who was so bitter and angry because she thought her prayers for her husband was, were not answered? And she stayed in that state for many years until she found out something that made a huge difference. Uh, many of our tears are unnecessary. Our false fixed belief, God has forsaken me. I've prayed and God's not going to answer. Those are false fixed beliefs. We know that heaven tells us there are no tears there. And the verse that tells us that in Revelation 22 says, because there's no death, no sorrow, and then it says no crying again, because the things that make us cry won't happen there. But I think there's one other reason there's not tears in heaven. It's because when we get there, we will be able to see that all those hard things that happened to us were for our good and for God's glory. And Mary couldn't see that right then. I'm going to give you a quote from a man I rarely quote. 
He's, he was rather humorous, but he was not godly. But he is Mark Twain. He is known for saying this. I have been through some horrible things in my life. And some of them actually happened. I'm good at going through horrible things <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> so let's don't, let's don't have unnecessary tears because we fail to believe the Lord.